reception for how truck so far it's been excellent everything is going really positively so far and we feel really happy yeah okay, we can't great. complain so we're gonna talk about the record okay and go through the songs okay so we're gonna start with the opener mm -hmm. which is called closer closer yeah so you press play and then it's like <laughs> wow that's a new chicken and sir. Yeah, we wanted the song to be really surprising, sound totally different, and I wanted it to be a really big statement for the album, and anybody that was a fan before, or even maybe not a fan of the band, I wanted them to really know, okay, this is like a big step, it's something new, and uh, it's really confident, you know, like bold, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like a fun song. Is it to you a sort of tribute to your influences from the 90s? I know you love like Cindy Lauper. Mm, sure, yeah. I mean, we talk a lot about the bands that influenced us growing up. You know, they made significant impressions on us as kids, but also probably, you know, the way that I see songs and structures and dynamics and all of that. So, like Madonna and Cindy Lauper, and even for me, like, um, closer, I like to almost think of it like when Bruce, like Bruce Springsteen was like my favorite growing up, mm -hmm. but I really loved like Nebraska and, mm -hmm. you know, Darkness on the Edge of Town and the River and like more of the like dark stuff. And when he put out Born in the USA, it's like, so different, right? Like Born in the USA, Dancing in the Dark, like those songs for someone who was listening to like Nebraska. Mm -hmm. It sounded like a dance Oh yeah, it sounded like a dance, dance record. record. It sounded crazy. Now it's like classic for Springsteen, mm -hmm. but back then it was such a big change and in a way I wanted to be able to have that moment for Tegan and Sarah. Like we know that people are used to hearing us sound a certain way, but we wanted to be able to make an aesthetic change. Mm -hmm. But people eventually would think like, oh these are the these are the best songs they've written, you know, but not be held back by guitars or whatever. You mm. know? Okay. Uh, on Goodbye Goodbye, it means you have a change, which is uh, more lyrical. Sure. It's a departure, yeah. lyrically speaking, from your previous work. Right. For me, it's like a very simple, straightforward song. You know, I I tend to write songs that the lyrics are a little bit more complicated, or maybe poetic, or a little bit more yeah, a little bit more vague, like you know what I'm talking about. But with this album, I really tried to be as straightforward as possible. Mm -hmm. Not because I didn't want it to have the same depth or the same intensity, but because sometimes I think when using metaphor and allegory and all of this stuff, it's like that can be a bit like hiding, you know, mm -hmm. like a, that's sort of putting up a bit of a defense or a, or a you know a mask of some sort. But I didn't want to be like that with this record. I really wanted to be super straightforward. Um, I wanted it, the, the lyrics to still be really broad and universal, like so that people would really, they wouldn't feel like it was a narrow experience that only sometimes you can understand. But uh, it was nerve-wracking to sing so clearly about things that I was feeling. That was hard. But I loved it. I loved Goodbye Goodbye. It was a good one. Even in the tone, it's different. Like it, the theme is still outbreak and sure. you know, but. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounds more like empowered. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, this is like, this record is sort of a, you know, if, if Sainthood, our last record, was sort of about someone rejecting you or not wanting you or, or even that martyred kind of waiting and longing, this record is like, so that it's over, you know, this is like post breakup. It's kind of the angry reflecting stage where you're sort of torn up about it. You know, but you also are kind of like moving on. The, the next song, I Was a Fool, I read um, that Tegan said 
she wanted to write something like Rihanna's umbrella for that one. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what she said. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's the demo you sent to to the producer of the record. Uh huh. Yeah. Closer and I was a fool were both songs that we sent out to producers and. Um, it was more of a piano ballad, you know, mm -hmm. just really simple, like an acoustic guitar and some piano. That riff, the da -na 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 -na, like that whole thing was in there. But I really was excited to turn it into something more of like a up-tempo ballad, you know. I, I didn't want it to, I didn't want to have it be too stripped down. But I think it's great. Um, I never, I never heard Rihanna, but I, I always joked with Tegan that it could be like a rock set song. <laughs> you remember that band rock set? Listen to your heart. Yeah. You know, like it's very. Uh, I don't know. It's it's sentimental. There's n it's not uh, it's not hiding behind any coolness. You know, like this is like a really straightforward song. What's the next one about? I'm not your hero. I'm not your hero. I'm not your hero. I wrote about you know reflecting on when I was younger, when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. and I didn't totally know what my future was going to look like. Being gay and being. Um, you know, living in the 90s and being a teenager, you know, it, it wasn't like it is today where I just thought, oh, I'll just have a girlfriend and my life will be normal, whatever that means to people. And uh, I was isolated in a lot of ways and I didn't necessarily have a lot of people to look up, up to. Like I had lots of support from my friends and from my family, but I didn't really know any other adult gay people who like had life like how I imagine my life being so I was thinking a lot about that and how you know it's it's difficult you once you once we started to have a career I felt like being very visible and talking about being gay and also talking about being you know not wanting to be held back because I was gay I, mean, I didn't I didn't like that in society people would say to us oh well you're a gay band so then only gay people can like you and I found that really offensive and reductive and I thought like I hated that. I thought like being straight doesn't hold you back from anything. And as a gay person, I like straight people's music. I like straight people's writing. Why can't straight people like my writing or my music? You know. So the song is kind of about all of those things. Like about feeling like you become somebody who speaks out about yourself, and that sometimes what you what you say isn't what other people you know agree with. So you, is that uh, who you are referencing to when you say I'm not their hero? I think I think it. I mean sometimes that it's the people who. It's not necessarily the the the, the villains like the people who I know are against me. Sometimes it's the people who are supposed to be my allies. You know, the people who are, I should have been close to, or the people I should have been able to look up to. I knew that I wasn't looking up. I, I couldn't look up to them. And then in a lot of ways, I know that there have been times in our career where just because you're gay or just because you have the same sort of politics as we do doesn't necessarily mean you identify with us or like us, you know, so, yeah, it's complicated. Um, so you just passed in, in France, like, yeah. last week, Did Yeah. You yes, that? I've been following uh, oh, yeah. all the, all the, um, the marches and protests mm -hmm. and everything like that in, in, in France, yeah. Do you think that uh, debating about it is quite, is kind of dividing people, or is it, at the contrary, like, Getting, are people getting together? Around it? You know, I think that there has to be dialogue and there has to be conversation. And you know, when when same-sex marriage passed in Canada, people debated it all the time, talked about it. People, some people, so you know, angry, and then other people that were so adamant that this had to happen. And I'll tell you, in the last 10 years, it's made no difference negatively in Canada. It's like people. It's become a part of just tolerance and acceptance in the country, and it, and you know, as someone who I, I never saw myself as getting married, not because I was gay, but just because marriage wasn't, it just wasn't a value that I had in my life. Um, but I always say to people, you know, like I, I never imagined myself getting married, but it really made me angry that I wasn't allowed to get married. Doesn't mean I want to get married, but I should be allowed to decide that for myself. And uh, so it's become, you know, an, a, re a really important cause and I think that it's it's so significant whether you believe in marriage or not. It should be something that I can make my own choice about. And uh, so it's good to see all the countries that are now coming aboard and, you know, I think that there will be a time where all of this will seem so 
it just people won't believe that this was such a big deal, you know. And it, and I think now is the time to put yourself on the right side of of history because it, people will look back and just be horrified at it, you know. And so I always tell my friends who are unsure or closeted or these things, I'm like, this is the time to get on the right side because you want to be with the movement that changed things, not hiding in the closet, you know. Yeah. How about adoption? Because the French conservatives are really worried about gay people raising children. Yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's so deeply offensive and it's, um, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, gay parents um, can be just as good of parents as anybody. And um, the idea that in this world where so many people don't have families or don't have kids, that anybody would be able to dictate whether or not two loving people can raise a child when the world is filled with people raising children that they didn't want or are not capable of raising them. You know, this is deeply offensive. This is m adoption and gay people having rights to have children. That is more offensive to me than marriage equality. It's like mm -hmm. the fact that anybody would ever tell me that I can't raise a child with the person that I love is, I, it's it's deeply offensive. It's good. Drop me wild. Drove Me Wild was a song that Tegan worked on um, with these guys, Sultan and Ned. They're sort of like a mm -hmm. dance um, dance group. And they had sent us some really cool uh, instrumental tracks. And so Tegan wrote some top lines for them. And we just ended up really liking the track and really enjoying the melody and kind of like the metaphor and stuff like that. So we decided to cut it and see if it would make, uh, make a cool album cut. And it did. And it's really fun. And it's a totally different tonal song than anything I think we've ever done before. Like, it really has this sort of, like, young, happy, carefreeness to it. Like, it's not, like, a super deep, sad song. Like, it really is just, like, kind of like a flirtatious, happy song, you know? Which, I don't think we have a lot of those in our catalog, so it's nice. The next one was written with uh, Jack Antonoff. Yeah. From Fun. Mm -hmm. And it's called How Come You Don't Want Me? Yeah, Jack's a good, good friend. And we joked around about maybe working together and, and working on some songs, and he sent me some tracks. Um, not necessarily for our own record, just in general, just songwriting for other people. And he, uh, he sent me this, this instrumental for this song, and I thought it was great, and I started writing a song. Almost like not for my band, like just writing a song almost like for like a, like a, like a teen pop star could sing or something, you know, like, um, like something that was kind of sassy. Yeah. <laughs> like, Would you which, say it's cheesy? Well, it's cheesy, like, see, I don't think it's cheesy when I'm singing it yeah. and I'm like really giving it. I'm yeah. like, it's a torch song, you know, like mm -hmm. it doesn't feel cheesy when you're singing it. But when I was writing the lyrics, like I was yeah. like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like the part about like, how come you don't want to win me now? Or why don't you want to win me now? Um, why don't you want to show me off? Like, it sounded so cheesy, but the truth is, is that it's like, I've felt that way about people. Like, where, like, someone rejects you, and you think, like, how come you don't want to, how could you break up with me? Like, you don't want to show me off? Like, what do you mean? Like, what the hell? So, I knew I was onto something, even though my instinct was to, like, to be like, oh, that's too straightforward, it's, like, too cheesy, too needy or something, like, ugh. But I feel like when I sing it, like when I really own it, no, it's not cheesy, I don't care what anyone says. Like you know? five years ago, would you have believed that you were gonna write that song? I th you know, I, I think that what's interesting is is that um, I look at, I, I remember when I was writing the con and I thought those songs were so cheesy, yeah. you know, because for me on uh, So Jealous, the record before, I was writing songs like Walking With A Ghost. What the hell does that mean? Nobody, you know, like the song is so vague, like lyrically, it's just, you can't, it's, it, there's nothing, you know, it's, it's cool, it's a cool word, it's a cool phrase, you know, like these types of things, but like, all of the personal stuff was like very veiled, you know? So for me to then to write songs like I Was Married or Back In Your Head or Relief Next To Me, those songs felt so cheesy because I was like, oh boohoo, confessional, like writing these songs. But they resonated so much with our audience that I started to realize that sometimes you have to bury yourself and be sort of embarrassing and cheesy to really connect with people. Mm -hmm. And you can be cool and you can write songs that are sort of aloof and like, you know, impenetrable and whatever. But like, I get more satisfaction out of singing the stuff that's really from the heart. And so, 
five years ago, I don't know if I would have been able to write the songs that I wrote for this record, but I will say that I've, I had already moved into a place in my life where I realized that it was braver to just be cheesy and say the truth and be honest than to write something super cool and hip and distant, you know? Hmm. I don't know if you thought about it, but it probably resonates more with people hmm. who's, who doesn't speak English in the first place, like who right. English is not their... Right, topic. because it's more straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like simpler words. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, well, that, you know, like, I think about, too, like, a lot of the artists that I've liked and the trajectory of their careers, and, like, when I think of, like, artists like, um, like Patsy Cline... Mm -hmm. And you know some of Bruce Springsteen's like sort of mid 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 cata uh, catalog work and stuff like that. Cindy Lauper and like um, you know classic songs like that I grew up on like Roy Orbison and like um, you know God I don't know like old country stuff. The Supremes. That stuff is so straightforward. It's like there is no joking around. Like it's just like I was crying over you. Like you know. It's just, it's the most plain turns of phrases and whatever, but the voice, like Dolly Parton, you know, like the, 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 the warble of the voice and the way it's used to be more significant than writing something really poetic and complicated, you know, lyrically. Um, so we're gonna go fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the next one, I Couldn't Be Your Friend. Uh, is funny to me because it has really depressing lyrics yeah. and a really poppy production. <laughs> I know, we really like that. I wanted them to be like, you know, here's the song and here's the lyrics, you know. I want them to be totally different from each other. But then it's the combination that I think we can strip it down and make it so sad, but then you can have it be this really big, bombastic, like, anthemic production that makes people be like, yeah, I'm having mm. the time of my life, but it's, like, the saddest song. Yeah. Love that you say. So, apparently, that was a song that you were asked to write for the soundtrack? Yeah, Tegan, Tegan initially wrote the song for a soundtrack, and we thought it was super cool. Again, like, super straightforward, mm -hmm. um, you know, just, like very transparent lyrics you know like just straightforward but we thought it was a great melody and so we ended up recording it and it didn't get used for the soundtrack so we recut it in the studio with Greg Kirsten and, and used some of the original ideas that we had from the original version but uh, yeah it's a great song it's a great song Now I'm All Messed Up Now I'm All Messed Up um, started as a piano ballad and um, again it was supposed to be like a real torch song like something really sad like I really imagined It kind of went into a different direction in the studio, but just as a piano ballad, I was like, I want tears, I want people to feel, I want to feel like they have their hearts ripped out. Like, that's who relates to this song. You are not, you are at rock bottom. You are at your lowest, if this is connecting to you. I really wanted to go to that place energetically. Okay. Yeah. And <coughs> record closes with Shock to Shock Your System, system. Yeah. which has, in my opinion, a strong drive influence the, the movie drive like the soundtrack sure really yeah me yeah yeah it's like it was supposed to sort of be like a um when i was building the production for it you know and i was building the um orchestral breakdowns the like da -na, da -na, da -na, like all that stuff i wanted it to sort of be like i was thinking of the 90s and how a lot of songs would start really big and then they would break down into these they would sort of i don't know they would uh what's the word i'm looking for Um, they would just de like you would deconstruct all the instrumentation until there was almost nothing but a vocal and something you know like I remember that from the 90s and then you would have these explosive B choruses and so I was really trying to build an instrumental that way and then but I wanted the vocals to sort of float over top of it which I think is reminiscent of some of the songs that are on dry on the drive soundtrack you know they just sort of stay in this one linear kind of place mm -hmm. melodically and whatever so um, Yeah, but I, th I thought it was a cool song. I didn't know if it would really fit with the rest of the record. Mm -hmm. It's pretty dark. It's definitely there's definitely no lightness in that song. But it, I think it it's makes it makes a really good closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, like if closer is here, shock is definitely here. You know. So yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Do you have anything else to add? No, I mean that was great. We really covered the whole record. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can't let you go without asking you when okay. you're gonna play in Paris next. Well, we're hoping to be back in June for a proper tour. Okay. So yeah, so you can expect us then. Okay. Yeah. Headlining tour? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Or festivals too, we don't know yet exactly, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you Sarah. very much. Thanks a lot.